Today, we will be discussing ossifying fibromas. So what is an ossifying fibroma? Well, it is a slow-growing, benign fibroosseous neoplasm. They are noted by their highly expansile nature, making them very large lesions. They can occur in any craniofacial bone, but they are most frequently found in the posterior portion of the mandible as depicted in the image on the right, with molar involvement being more common than premolar involvement. There is one variant of ossifying fibromas, and that is a juvenile ossifying fibroma. This variant differs as it is more commonly found in children, is highly aggressive, and more commonly located in the maxilla. Although the cause is unknown, this neoplasm is derived from mesenchymal tissue. Radiographically, the lesion is well demarcated with uniform trabeculation. These lesions have a characteristic shelling out upon removal. This means that they are easily separated from bone. The removed mass will be white, smooth, elastic, yet firm tumors. Microscopically, in general, we will see the ossifying nature of this lesion with irregular mineralized osteoid, with osteoblasts along the periphery, and disordered fibrous tissue. These histological features are demonstrated in the figure on the right. You will notice that the fibrous connective tissue has well-differentiated spindle fibroblasts and plump osteoblasts along the rim of the fibroma. Osteoclasts are infrequently seen. Within the connective tissue, you can see how the collagen lies in an unorganized pattern. Bony spheroids may also be seen in the connective tissue. Oftentimes, in juvenile ossifying fibromas, bony structures dominate the fibrous connective tissue component. Despite all of these histological findings, it is still necessary to combine histological, radiographic, and clinical findings to obtain a proper diagnosis. Now, let's take a moment to review the clinical findings associated with ossifying fibromas. Overall, it is an uncommon lesion, but when it does occur, it typically affects females in their third or fourth decade of life. As shown in the figure, Shelby simulates what it could look like if she had an ossifying fibroma. She's even the right age and gender to fit the description. If this lesion is seen in a child, it would be more specifically referred to as the juvenile ossifying fibroma. There are a few clinical signs and symptoms that should be looked for when creating a differential diagnosis of ossifying fibromas. First, a patient would show slow and persistent growth. This growth over time can cause expansion and thinning of the buccal and lingual cortical plates in the area of the fibroma. Although this expansion can be significant, perforation and mucosal ulceration is rare. Second, this is an asymptomatic lesion. Often when these lesions are first recognized, it's the dentist that observes them while taking routine dental radiographs. If observed and diagnosed early enough, these lesions may appear small. Last, as previously mentioned, ossifying fibromas are expansive lesions. The majority of these lesions are solitary, and as they expand, they can cause facial asymmetry. For an accurate diagnosis for an ossifying fibroma, radiographs must be considered. This will be touched on in more detail in the radiographic findings section. As dental students, it's always important for us to reflect upon the direct head and neck application of any pathology. Expanding upon what we previously mentioned, ossifying fibromas are found in the jaws, in the craniofacial bones, and in the anterior cranial fossa. When found in the jaw, ossifying fibromas occur in the mandible 90% of the time compared to the maxilla. They are also typically found in the molar premolar area above the mandibular canal. As these lesions expand, depending on their location, these fibromas can impinge on surrounding structures. For example, if the sinonasal structure is involved with an ossifying fibroma, growth can cause extension into the nasal or sinus cavities. Let's talk about the radiographic findings. Ossifying fibromas are often discovered radiographically. A few extremely consistent features of these lesions is their well-defined borders, their generally expansive profile, and their radiolucent rim. However, they show variant patterns depending on the density of calcifications present. When they are an early lesion, they are more radiolucent and become more radiopaque as they age. The lesion may appear mixed radiolucent radiopaque with different degrees of calcified bone. 
Finally, ossifying fibromas commonly cause displacement of the roots and mandibular canal, as well as cortical bone expansion, while less commonly causing root resorption and cortical perforation. Figure 5 represents an example of decreased bone density compared to normal bone with displacement of the roots. Figure 6 is a periapical view of a well-defined mixed lesion showing dense calcified bone within the radiolucency. Figure 7 is the axial view of a CBCT showing an example of an ossifying fibroma exhibiting lingual cortical plate expansion and a well-defined border. Figure 8 is a cropped panel representing a classic example of an ossifying fibroma. It is a single, well-circumscribed, mixed radiolucent radiopaque lesion with a radiolucent rim separating it from the surrounding bone. The lesion extends from the mesial root of number 19 to the distal root of number 18. Figure 9 shows a lateral ceph radiograph showing a mixed density lesion with diffuse calcifications throughout. Figure 10 shows a post-operative radiograph taken from the same patient following the resection of the tumor and reconstruction of the mandible with a reconstruction plate. Periapical cementoosseous dysplasia, also known as PCOD, is a possible differential interpretation. There are, however, some key differences between an ossifying fibroma and PCOD. PCOD demonstrates a sclerotic rather than a radiolucent border and is often multifocal. Little, and sometimes no, expansion of the cortical bone is seen in PCOD. The reconstructed panoramic radiograph shows an example of multifocal PCOD in the anterior mandible, which is a common place to find PCOD. Fibrous dysplasia is another possible differential interpretation of an ossifying fibroma. The key features that distinguish fibrous dysplasia are its ill-defined borders, lack of root resorption, and the anatomic enlargement that is seen compared to concentric enlargement. Figure 12 is an MRI of fibrous dysplasia, which is expanding the roof of the orbit. In figure 13, we see fibrous dysplasia in the upper left quadrant. A well-differentiated osteosarcoma can also be included in the differential interpretation of an ossifying fibroma. The two lesions are very similar radiographically. However, osteosarcomas are often more aggressive. Because an osteosarcoma is a malignant lesion, some clinical features may be experienced by the patient, such as pain, paresthesia in the area, or lymphadenopathy. Osteosarcomas will also show mitotic activity, unique to the malignant lesion, as well as cytologic atypia and possibly soft tissue extension. The image shows an osteosarcoma of the mandible, demonstrating the characteristic sunburst appearance often seen with this lesion. The last differential interpretation we will discuss is sinonasal masses. Some examples include sinonasal melanomas and lymphomas, which are painless masses that grow slowly. These lesions have the potential to become aggressive, so they are important to distinguish from ossifying fibromas. Sinonasal masses are often differentiated due to their lack of fibrous tissue containing a high collagen content that we would see in an ossifying fibroma. Figure 15 shows a sinonasal melanoma, while figure 16 is an example of a sinonasal lymphoma that is extending anterior to the left maxillary sinus. Let's talk about treatment of an ossifying fibroma. Since they are considered slow growing, conservative surgical excision is the treatment of choice. The encapsulated nature of ossifying fibromas encourages easy removal by enucleation with minor curatage. If the lesion presents with aggressive behavior noted by rapid growth and large size, more extensive surgery may be needed. This includes jaw resections followed by reconstructive surgery as depicted to the figures on the right. In both cases of small or large lesions, the recurrence rate is rare. Now, during the treatment of juvenile ossifying fibromas, more aggressive removal is required. Larger margins of resection are needed compared to its adult counterpart. The recurrence rate of juvenile ossifying fibromas is between 38 to 50 percent, so you will need more frequent follow-up appointments. Here are our references. Here is the image citations page. Thank you for listening to our presentation over ossifying fibromas. Please enjoy other videos posted to Dr. Kim's YouTube channel.